Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerning Hearts presents Discerning the Will of God with Father Timothy Gallagher. This series of programs is a special presentation of a seminar conducted by Father Gallagher on discerning the will of God, as taught by St. Ignatius of Loyola. Handouts alluded to by Father Gallagher can be found in the description below, or you can find it in the post for this episode found at discerninghearts.com. We now begin Conference 2 of Discerning the Will of God with Father Timothy Gallagher. So let's pick up right where we left off last time. And we had left Robert as a young man struggling to discern between an attraction that he feels to the priesthood and simultaneously a very strong and real attraction to marriage with Helen. He loves the Lord. He wants to do God's will. How will Robert be able to discern? And as we mentioned, we are in a different set of choices now. And these are significant choices, obviously, where the discernment is of great importance. We concluded by saying last time that uh, if we look at the preceding three categories of choice, none of the principles involved in them are going to help Robert in this case, because uh, this is a different kind of choice. Uh, if I may say so, probably it's uh, this kind of discernment, significant discernments, when we're seeking God's will, that probably is what brought most of us to be a part of these reflections, seeking light on these kinds of choices. But I didn't want to start there because by going through the preceding three categories, we get a sense of how God's will can really guide everything in our lives, peacefully, serenely. Uh, we, we, we follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Jesus is Lord in our lives. But there is this additional category of choices where the discernment will require something more than what we've seen thus far in the preceding situation. So let's look at another instance of this, not vocation, but career. And this is Brian, Brian and Lisa. We had been married for several years and our third child had just been born. I had worked in finance for a number of years but found myself increasingly interested in serving in a more direct way. So a question of a change of career is uh, presenting itself. The thought of becoming an optometrist continued to arise in my mind, all the more as my life of faith deepened. I spoke with Lisa about this. We both thought that I could do it, but it would mean some real sacrifices for Lisa while I was in optometry school. For several months, we talked and prayed about this. How will Brian, together with Lisa, discern in this case? Uh, this is a question, obviously, of a career choice. Again, the same three categories that we mentioned in significant choices are present here. Both options are good, finance, optometry. Brian and Lisa with him, they are free to choose either the one or the other. And this is a choice of some significance. How will Brian discern in this case? How will he and Lisa discern whether the Lord is calling him to this career change, whether the attraction that he feels to a change uh, of career, which will allow him to serve people more directly, is really a call from the Lord to Brian and to his family. Again, we are in the category of significant choices. From here on, as we go forward, in these reflections with Ignatius, that's going to be our focus. Our focus will be on significant choices, um, <clears throat> which we can do now because we have clarified the different kinds of choices. But Ignatius' teaching in the spiritual exercises, although he explicitly indicates that it can apply to um, many different things in our lives, what he calls a reform of life, changes that may allow us to live this or that aspect of our life more in accord with the Lord's will for us, uh, to live more deeply the vocation to which he's called us. 
primarily Ignatius is focusing on significant choices of this kind and in providing help for us in discerning in such situations. So let's move now through our outline to the second of these pieces which are essential in the process of discernment. So we have moved now, we move now from clarifying the different kinds of choices in which we discern to the actual process of discernment itself. And the first thing is to build our discernment on a solid foundation. If you want to build something like this, a tall building, but really any edifice of any kind, if you want the rest of the building to go well, you start by building a solid foundation. You get the foundation right, and then the rest of your application in building the building is going to go well. If you don't get the foundation right, you can put all the care and hard work that one desires into the subsequent uh, higher structures of raising the building. But if the foundation isn't solid, your building is not going to, to last. So that something similar for Ignatius is evident and important in any process of discernment. If you are discerning, so this would be any one of us who is part of these reflections who may be facing a discernment now, or all, certainly all of us as we go through life will be facing various discernments. If you are discerning, start with a solid foundation. This is Ignatius' first counsel to anyone who is discerning. And this is Ignatius, uh, as I mentioned before, classic principle and foundation, as he calls it, which is the first step in the process of discernment, building the solid foundation on which a sound process of discernment can then be built. So we need to ask the most foundational, fundamental question about discernment. You, are, are, you, you had enough interest to become a part of these reflections on discerning God's will, which indicates that dis doing God's will, discerning God's will is important for you. And praise God, that's the way it needs to be in our lives. But let's ask this most basic question. Why do you want to discern God's will? Why is this important to you? How do we answer that question? The answer to that question depends on an even more fundamental question. Why do you want to do God's will? We only want to discern God's will because we want to do God's will. Why do you want to do God's will? It's a good question to really think about. This is the foundational question. This is where the discernment process really starts. I still remember when I was writing the book on discerning God's will, I remember sitting at my desk in the office where I was writing. And I was just ready after the introduction to begin dealing with the process of discernment itself. So it was at this initial point, this foundational point, where the whole process starts. And I did call this chapter in the book Foundation. And I, to this day, believe it was God's grace because as I sat there, uh, the page was blank before me on the computer. I hadn't yet written a word. This verse from scripture came to my heart. We love because he first loved us. And I realized this is the answer. The whole foundation why do we want to do and therefore discern God's will? It's all contained in 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. To explicitate it a little bit, when the human heart, that's your heart and my heart, when your heart discovers that this world is not just an empty, formless place, That your life is not meaningless, just random, absurd, the existentialist philosophers would have said some years ago. That your life is not without meaning. That you have been loved from all eternity. And that your very existence, the fact that you are alive and thinking and breathing and feeling is a gift of love. When our hearts discover this, some of us were given this early in life 
by faith-filled parents. Some of us came to this through various changes and stages of life. But when the human heart now knows this, then our hearts rejoice. It's the happiest thing in the world to know the meaning of our life, to know that we've been loved from all eternity. All that we are is a gift of love. And a yearning to respond awakens. And this is the deep point from which discernment first begins. That someone has loved me, does love me that much, has given me all that I am. And my heart rejoices to know this, and something in my heart wants to respond to it. That's the foundation of discernment. Then the human will thirsts for communion with the divine will, which is another just a way of saying the same thing. The human will, your will, that can choose, that has freedom, that makes choices, thirsts for communion, harmony with the divine will, that is God's will. And again, we are at the very origins of any process of discernment here. You can see why Ignatius calls this the foundation. Then the human will thirsts for communion with the divine will, that communion of wills which is mutual love. When we say that two people love each other and their love is growing deeper, what do we mean? What we mean most deeply is the will of the one and the will of the other are deepening in their communion, both willing the same thing, both willing the same things. Here is a young man, and young, healthy, capable, bright. And the basic question which guides his choices is this. I want to spend my afternoon this way. I want to listen to this kind of music. I want to go there on the weekend. I want to dedicate myself to these kinds of studies. I want to. Then the young man falls in love. And now the question changes. Now the question becomes, what do you want? What would you like to do this evening? How would you like to spend Saturday? Would you like to listen to this? Where would you like to have supper this evening? And so forth. This is what we mean when we say that love is essentially a communion of wills. When one person falls in love with another person, this becomes the fundamental question. When the love is really authentic, and mutual. Each person is saying to the other, what do you want? The communion of wills is growing between them. So that love is essentially a communion of wills. And you can see where all of this is going. When the human heart discovers that it is so loved by the divine heart, by God, and it wants to respond in love, Foundationally, most fundamentally, what it desires is a deepening communion of wills. It asks increasingly that question of God, what do you want? The deepest expression of this is the Holy Trinity, which is precisely the infinite eternal communion of wills, which is the infinite eternal communion of love in the persons of the Trinity. So why do you want to discern God's will? Each one of us can ask him or herself, why do I want to discern God's will? And I want to reverence the fact that we are all on the stages of growth in the spiritual life. We'll be at different places with this, but these are the fundamental truths that we're growing more deeply into. We want to do God's will and therefore to discern God's will so that we can do it because we know that we are loved. And we want to respond to that love with an ever-increasing communion of wills. As Jesus says, I always do what the Father asks. I always do what the Father wants. And there you have the infinite communion of wills. Now I'm going to stop talking for a moment. And I invite us, as we look at various scriptural passages here, to pray with this foundation briefly, because that's where Ignatius invites us 
to begin a process of discernment is immersion in the foundation. So I invite us just to let our hearts be at peace, at rest. We'll have a soft musical background to this, and this will just be a very, oh, maybe three or four minutes. And I invite us to let Jesus, let the Lord say these words to your heart. Touch the place of the foundation. Just dwell there for a moment in prayer. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady. 
all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, or Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. So if we are discerning, this is the place to start with the solid foundation. And this is where Ignatius invites us to begin in the process of discernment, is just by letting our hearts know how infinitely, eternally we are loved. And the delight the Lord takes in us, how he's given of himself for us, given himself for us. So that you can see discernment is not just a simple skill or technique. It's a relationship. It's a response of love to being loved. And whatever helps us to grow in the knowledge of the way God loves us, that is going to help us build our discernment on a solid foundation. I think you can also see why Ignatius invites us to pray with this foundation which is the first need in a process of discernment. All right, let's move from biblical reflections to some lived experiences of the foundation. So if you take your hand out, we have this uh, selection from Michael. And Michael is, as you'll see here, he's a sophomore in college. He's a confused 19-year-old um, man, and he's struggling with the whole meaning and purpose of his life. And the following takes place. I can actually point to a moment when the pieces of my fragmented life came together for the first time. You can hear foundational language there. He's not consciously Ignatian at all. But this is, Ignatius is just putting into words what happens in sound discernment. I was a sophomore in college going in several directions at once, trying to keep my options open, plagued in particular with questions about God. On the day of my 19th birthday, I went into the woods on the outskirts of town and grandly announced to God, I am staying here in the woods until you do it. What was it? To let me know for sure that he existed, to reveal how I could know him, to speak to me. I stayed in the woods all evening all I stayed in the woods all day and into the evening. I was hungry and thirsty and it was getting cold. I was a little scared but I was stubborn. I was determined to stay in the woods until I got an answer. Something that I really like about this obviously I think Michael himself and none of us certainly I would not recommend this as an approach to uh, finding God's will in our lives. But what I I find so, I don't know how to say um, loving, I guess, uh, about this is that the Lord takes us where we are. And all of us looking at our own lives can see that. 
Michael is just doing the best he can in his confused situation. And that's all that God needs. It's all that God needs in our lives too. But once we can learn from our tradition, um, many things that are confusing and where we struggle to find a way clarify for us and we move forward much more surely. But God meets us where we are. The answer came at about eight, at around eight, eight thirty in the evening. The puzzle of God suddenly cleared up in my mind. So there's an infusion of truth in Michael's mind. A conviction grew in me that he did indeed exist and that the church was an institution that told the truth about him. I could have confidence in it. The Lord spoke to my heart too, so it's not just to his mind, but also to his heart. He loved me. Okay, you can see the foundation being laid here. He would forgive my sins and heal my wounds. I was home. All this was a free gift of God. I was a desperate case, so he had pity on me and gave me everything at once. This was the foundation. Now, Michael doesn't know that he's using Ignatian terminology, but in point of fact, he is. And very accurately, to know that God is real and to know that he can find God in the church and to know that God loves him, that God will heal him. You can see the foundational pieces solidly entering into his mind and heart. Now watch what immediately happens. The vocation I discerned later flowed from this relationship with the Lord that began that evening in the woods. That was the key. That relationship has been there ever since. Discernment begins when that foundation is given to us. As I said earlier, to some of us it was given very early in life through loving and faith-filled parents. Some of us may have struggled more to come to lay a hold of, um, to embrace, to become aware of and embrace that foundation. But once it is in place, once we know that God is real, that God loves us, has loved us from eternity, then something in us wants to respond. And that's when discernment is born. As Michael says so, so richly here, it's out of that relationship, knowing that he's loved and wanting to respond, that the discernment that took place later in his life uh, came out of that, built on that foundation. Let's look at a second example in a different setting. So th this is Catherine. Catherine has finished college. She's working and she is in a kind of ongoing discernment between marriage and religious life. I, f I had, finished, had finished college and begun working. She was dating a young man and was also considering religious life. Months passed, and her search for God's will continued. One day she was driving home from work. Catherine describes what occurred that evening. Quote, the presence of Jesus palpably filled that white 93 Ford Escort LX. I hesitate to describe the experience for fear of making it sound more or less than it was. Really, we're on holy ground in Catherine's experience here. It was like being in a room with someone you love but cannot see, yet you can feel his eyes on you. He didn't say anything. He just looked at me and his look. It was like when a guy looks at you, not with lust, but with a desire that you be his girl. It's astounding to have God look at you like that, both exhilarating and humbling, because you know it's totally unmerited. To my surprise, I felt very much like when I had first fallen in love, except that it was magnified a hundred times. A very direct dialogue ensued, and with great reverence, because as I say, we're on holy ground here. Look at the question that arises in Catherine's heart when she finds that she's loved more than she could have ever imagined. I kept saying, What do you want? What do you want? Can you see? the foundation on which discernment is built. When her heart thrills and rejoices to know that she's loved so much by God, this is the question that arises. What do you want? It's like St. Paul when he encounters the Lord on the way to, to Damascus. What would you have me do, Lord? And for any one of us, and this is most deeply, Ignatius, as I've said before, is just putting into explicit language 
what's been there in the hearts of any one of us who has wanted to do and therefore discern God's will. I kept saying, what do you want? What do you want? The gist of his reply was, you can do whatever you please. You can get married. You can have the job of your choice. But it would please me if you would have me. He had asked a question and waited for an answer. He wouldn't force me. It was powerful yet gentle persuasion. Never have I felt so free, which will always be the case in real discernment. Yet at the same time, it seemed impossible that I should say no. I pulled into the parking lot and sat in my car, finally saying, whatever, whatever you want, Lord. And with reverence, let's pause on that because we could not find better words to describe the disposition to which Ignatius will will lead us um, as a preparation for discernment, whatever, whatever you want, Lord. When our hearts are ready to say that, as we look at the various options and the choice we face, The disposition necessary for discernment is there in our hearts, and we are ready to begin the process itself of discernment. Then the presence that had surrounded me seemed to pierce through me and close around my heart. This is the French Catholic philosopher Gabriel Marcel. When I was in in my years in theology, I took an elective course on his philosophy. And one of the things that I have never forgotten from his writings is this simple and absolutely profound sentence. To be is to be loved. To be is to be loved. This is the deepest philosophical, metaphysical, ontological, use whatever word we want there, This is the deepest truth of our whole being. The more we understand the truth of who we are, the more we'll recognize that this little sentence best describes our reality. If we are, it's because we're loved. We've been loved from all eternity. It's another way of describing the foundation of discernment. I want to quote some frequently cited words of the servant of God, Pedro Arupe who was the general of the Jesuits uh, for many years and uh, whose cause of canonization has now been introduced. And uh, as the, these words are, are, are given to us, we're told there's some discussion of this, but what is most frequently said is that Father Arupe was giving a talk to a group of Jesuit priests and he was speaking about the spiritual life and our relationship with God and the love of God in our lives. And one of the participants uh, raised his hand and said, Father, all of that is true and beautiful and important, but we have to be practical. In other words, we have to look at the concrete situations and, and so forth. And Father Arupe is said to have responded with these words. Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quite final, absolute way. What you are in love with, what fills your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. And these are the the most frequently, um, I'd say, famous words. Fall in love. Stay in love. In one sense, we can summarize the spiritual life in those words, stay in love. Fall in love. Stay in love. And it will decide everything. So if you are facing a discernment now or at any time in the future, and you seek light and you wonder how to proceed, there is nothing more important Nothing better you can do to grow in discernment than to fall in love with the Lord, to stay in love. That's an ongoing, nourishing life of prayer, the sacraments in the church. And it will decide everything. 
the deeper that communion of wills, which is love between the human heart and the divine grows in your heart, the clearer your discernment will become. That's the foundation where all discernment begins. You have now um, in the handout what I'm calling a contemporary reading of St. Ignatius' classic text of the foundation in the spiritual exercises. And as we just did a few minutes ago, I'm going to invite us just to pray through this. Uh, you have the text in the, in the handout, and I would invite you to go back over this text. If I can be bold, I'd say repeatedly. You can never go over it too much. If you think of the people that St. Ignatius took through this process of discernment in his own lifetime, future saints like St. Pierre Fav and St. Francis Xavier, and you think that he had them spend days deeply immersing themselves in these truths and how much more we need it today in our own secular culture. You can never steep, we can never steep ourselves too deeply in this. So again, I'd invite you prayerfully just to let the words enter your heart and your mind. This classic line from Dante's Divine Comedy that I quoted before, in la sua voluntade e nostra pace, in his will is our peace. If we live according to the truths that Ignatius summarizes so briefly and richly in that text of the foundation, then we're building on a solid foundation in everything we do in our lives. And the, the, really the beautiful fruit of that is peace. Again, I'll repeat this because this is so important for those, well, for, for any who live in a secularized culture. We need to steep ourselves in those truths. I warmly invite you to take that text of Ignatius and read it, reflect on it, and pray on it, and a number of times. This is a, a photograph toward the end of his life of one of our oblate priests, a really remarkable man. This is Father Greg Staub. And in the smaller photo there, you'll see Father Greg before he contracted this illness, multiple systems atrophy, MSA. And usually from onset until the, um, the person's decease, it'll be about maybe six, seven years, something like that. Father Greg lived with this for eight years and spent the last, it was four or five years uh, like this in the hospital as one system after another in his body gradually shut down. And at this point, as you can see, he's not able to move very much. The, the, the photo um, shows his daily practice. And you know, there were always visitors 
Uh, people flocked to him. He re really a, a saintly man. Uh, he was about 60 when, uh, when he died of this illness, uh, maybe about five years ago. And every day he would say Mass on this hospital tray. Uh, as his mobility decreased, uh, it got so he could still, with his finger, touch the screen of an iPad. He would go through the prayers of the Mass that way. And finally, others would say the Mass uh, with him and for him when he could no longer do even that. And every day after the Mass, he would expose the Blessed Sacrament there with the help of others and would spend an hour like this in his holy hour. That's what we're seeing in this, in this image. When uh, Father um, Greg contracted this illness, he was out of the country and he was brought back for medical care. And um, uh, to our community in Boston, where I was stationed at the time, and a point came when I realized just how serious this illness was. He was still mobile at that time and doing ministry with some limitations. Um, and I still remember we uh, met each other in the corridor uh, one day, and I just found words to let him know that I had just realized um, the nature of the illness and what he uh, would in all likelihood lay uh, ahead for him. And uh, in all simplicity, he just looked at me and he said, well, Ignatius in the foundation says, long life, short life, just whatever God wants. And his will is our peace. If we can live that foundation, uh, so many of our anxieties will fall away from us. Uh, he understood that God was calling him to go through this illness. He was ready to say yes to it. In his will is our peace. This is a classic uh, paragraph from St. John Henry Newman, which you also have in the handout. And it's from a meditation on the fact of our creation as a source of hope, which is a beautiful thing. The fact that we understand that we have life and being because of God's creative gift to us, God's uh, act of creation and giving us life is a source of hope for us as we go through life. And the famous words are these. We are all created to his glory. I am created to do something or to be something for which no one else is created. God has created me to do him some definite service. You can already see how much you matter to God and how much you matter to this world. That God has created you, has created me, to do something for which no one else was created, to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me, which he has not committed to another. And I love this final sentence, I have my mission. Every one of us can say that. And the most important thing in our lives is to understand that mission and to fulfill it, which is where discernment comes into our lives. To say this in slightly different language, this often repeated phrase of St. John Paul II, that each of us is unique and unrepeatable. Unique. There's no one else like you, which is an amazing thing when you think about it. What are we, seven billion people in the world and add to that the thousands of years of human history? And there's no one like you. And there never will be. You are unrepeatable. There never will be another one like you. God has committed to you some task, some mission to do something, to be something which he has given to no other. You can say with St. John Henry Newman, I have my mission. Think of Mary at the moment of the Annunciation and all that depended upon her yes to the call to be God's mother. There was no other Mary. Think of the young Francis of Assisi who says yes to God's call with all the richness that has come into the church and the world as a result. There was no other Francis. Think of the parents of St. Therese of the Child Jesus, now canonized St. Celie and Louis Martin, who gave us 
through their marriage and their family, the one that St. Pius X called the greatest saint of modern times, St. Therese, and also a second child now, servant of God, Leonie Martin, another of their daughters whose cause of canonization is underway. There was no other Zélie, no other Louis. We won't recognize this photo. This is Mabel Tolkien, the mother of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, whom we all know from The Lord of the Rings. Not many people would even know anything about Mabel. She died when she was 34. Uh, her husband, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's father, died when Mabel was 26, and the mother of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and his brother. They were in South Africa. She came back to England. Um, she had no means of support. She had the two children. And uh, the family uh, assisted her until she and her sister converted and entered the Catholic Church. And at that point, the family completely rejected her. her they put such pressure on the two sisters that Mabel's sister actually did unhappily, uh, unwillingly leave the Catholic Church again. Mabel refused to do so. And in her son's mind, in J.R.R. Tolkien's mind, she was a martyr for the faith. They lived in abject poverty, as you can imagine. And uh, she had situations of health for which care was not available for financial reasons. She died when she was 34. And because of her witness, he considered her a martyr for his faith, uh, for her faith. His Catholicism was deeply, deeply rooted in her son. And it's at the heart of the Lord of the Rings and everything in his life. He was the daily communicant uh, through the years of his life when he was there at Oxford teaching. There was no other Mabel. Her quiet, hidden fidelity through her son has impacted the world. This is the uh, Margarita Sarto, was the mother of St. Pius X. And when he was made bishop, he went back to their small little town up in northern Italy where his elderly mother still lived. And she took his hand, and uh, on his hand, she looked at the Episcopal ring, the bishop's ring, which he now had on his hand. And she looked at that ring on his hand, and she said, you would not have that ring were it not for this ring. And she held up her hand and showed him her wedding ring. There was no other Margarita Sarto. And with just one final example, this was the priest who was pastor of my home parish when I was growing up for 27 years until for reasons of illness uh, at an elderly age, he had to step down. He built the church and the rectory, began the parish and left it as a flourishing parish. You can see in the uh, older picture, the a picture of him as an older man that he's holding his hand against his chest because he has advanced Parkinson's at this point. That's finally why he had to um, resign as pastor because he wasn't able to say mass in public anymore. There was no other Father James Wolfe. I wouldn't be a priest today if it hadn't been for Father James Wolfe. And all of us in our different vocations can understand that same truth. You are unique and unrepeatable. You have your mission, a mission that God has given to no other person than to you. Places of prayer again. I think uh, we'll begin to look at this in scripture. I think it's time for us now to take our break. And uh, the next time we, we meet, we'll pick up with this again. You've been viewing Discerning the Will of God with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download audio recordings from this seminar and so much more from Father Gallagher, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find many of these programs within the free Discerning Hearts app. You can also view other teachings by Father Gallagher on YouTube by checking out the various playlists below. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts, we hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, 
consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Discerning the Will of God with Father Timothy Gallagher.